Richard, uh, biologist with the Coastal Resources Division of the Georgia Department of Natural Resources. And I'm B.J. Hilton. I'm also a biologist here with Georgia DNR. And uh, we're going to show you some of the animals today that we uh, have uh, on our, in our coastal waters and, and some of these that, that we encounter a lot in our, our survey that we're responsible for, the Ecological Monitoring Trawl Survey, where we monitor shrimp and crab populations um, along the coast uh, to uh, assist with the, the regulation surrounding the shrimp fishery. Uh, so we'll just start right off uh, with the, the white shrimp. There's, there's essentially three species of shrimp that we are, are primarily concerned with on the coast of Georgia. That's the white shrimp, brown shrimp, and pink shrimp. Pink shrimp, to the lesser degree, there's fewer of those. Uh, this is a white shrimp. These are the ones that are the most common. They're the, the most abundant in the fishery. Uh, you can see they have a whitish color, the, uh, a very characteristic sort of chartreuse tail, these long antennae. Um, and they're very abundant <clears throat> in our waters. Uh, we have a, a, an example, BJ's got an example of a male and a female to show you the difference between those, how we identify them to help assess the population. Yeah, so if you can look closely here, between the front two legs, we can tell that this is a male. And as we pull the front two legs of the female back, there's, there's nothing there. Nothing there. Just clean. That little that little structure, the clasper, is is that's the uh, the the structure that the male uses to transfer the uh, reproductive packet from from himself to the female, and then she'll carry it around with her until she's ready to to release her eggs and then fertilize the eggs and, and just disperse them into the water column. Once she uh, fertilizes and disperses her eggs, she has no more interaction with her offspring. They they're free, free floating, free swimming uh, larvae, and they make their way back up into our creeks and rivers. And they grow very quickly. Uh, in the warmer months, they'll grow up to an inch a month. And as they grow, they make their way back towards the mouth of the estuary, back towards uh, the offshore waters. And when they get about this size, they get ready to reproduce. And in the spring, they will move into the near shore off the beaches here, and uh, they'll, they'll spawn again and start the cycle over happens every year. So those are uh, very common uh, on our coast and the, the shrimping industry in Georgia uh, is valued at somewhere around $10 million on average every year. So it's very important, especially in some of our smaller coastal towns. Another popular fishery um, here in, in coastal Georgia is blue crabs. And uh, right here we have an, an immature female blue crab. Um, I can tell she's immature because of this triangular pattern up underneath, whereas a mature female would be more oval shaped. And then the male, uh, the male apron structure looks like uh, the Washington Monument and the females, the adult females will look like a Capitol dome. This sort of pyramid shape is kind of in between, as BJ said, that triangular shape is the is the immature female. Uh, another popular, uh, not, not commercially popular as much as uh, uh, recreationally popular fish, this is a southern kingfish, also known as a whiting. Uh, very popular sport fish in our area. This guy's pretty feisty. They're, they're really beautiful in color when they're, when they're fresh out of darker water. This one, we caught this one yesterday, and it was really, really colorful when it came out of the water. Color is often a, 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 can be misleading with identifying fish because it varies so much. But uh, these guys are really pretty when they're when they're uh, when they're fresh out of the water. Another uh, common catch in our survey is the spot. Whoops, he's fine. Uh, <laughs> uh, spot, and you can tell why they call them a spot. It's a species of drum. It has this spot uh, in the same family as drum, and it has this spot on the shoulder area there. And uh, we catch these in very large numbers in our trawl, uh, almost, almost every, well everywhere up and down the coastline, really. And then BJ's got a flounder to show you. Here we have a southern flounder. Um, as you can see, it's a flat fish, both eyes on the top side, bottom side is white. They lay on the bottom, they're an ambush predator. Uh, they, they can change their color to blend to their surroundings and camouflage themselves. Um, very popular, one of, the, one of the most popular game fish species here in coastal Georgia. 
Another interesting fish that we see pretty often, this is a really small one. This is an Atlantic spade fish. And here sometimes folks will call these angel fish. That's not actually correct. This is a, a, an Atlantic spade fish. They get very, very large, surprisingly large. Uh, and they put up quite a fight on hook and line. Um, but we see them inshore in our inshore waters. They're mostly this size or maybe a little bit larger and they're in schools. They'll school together in groups of 15 or 20. And um, we see these pretty often. They're very pretty fish, neat, neat to catch, neat to see. Another one that's neat to see and neat to catch is this striped burfish that, that BJ has. A lot of folks will call these puffers. They do puff up. They'll, they'll inflate their body cavity with water in their stomach and swell themselves up as a defense mechanism and spread these spikes, these bony spikes out to make them harder to swallow. Uh, but it's not called a blowfish and it's not called a puffer fish. It's actually a striped burfish. Um, there are puffers in our waters, but they don't have nearly as pronounced spikes. They're just kind of, their, their skin is rough, but it's not spiky like this. Um, we have another interesting critter that um, we're gonna show you here real quick. Dylan's gonna bring us over a, uh, this is a, a horseshoe crab, which is actually more closely related to spiders than it is to that blue crab. You can see underneath the structure, kind of a creepy looking underside. They're really interesting critters, very ancient form of life. They've been around on the planet for a very, very, very long time. They're important in uh, the biomedical field for a variety of reasons. The main, the main reason being that they have some interesting compounds in their blood that are used, uh, one of which is used to stabilize vaccines, the production of vaccines. And their blood, unlike mammal blood, which is iron-based and features the hemoglobin molecule, um, these guys have copper-based blood. So their blood is actually blue. Uh, they, when they harvest the blood from these for biomedical research, they'll, they'll uh, put a needle into a, a, a vein right here inside this, this area here, and they'll actually bleed out their blood into a vial and it's, it's actually quite bright blue. It's kind of interesting looking. Uh, but you'll see these occasionally on the beach. When you do see them on the beach, they're, they, they may be in uh, spawning uh, configuration or activity. Uh, sometimes you'll see the male. This is a female. You can tell because of this, this mating scar on the lower part of her carapace here. I mean, the lower part of her exoskeleton. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> That's indicative that she's an, a mature female and has actually released once. Um, and uh, the males are usually much smaller and they will attach themselves back here and, the, and she'll drag them around for several days or for however long that they, they decide is appropriate before the spawning time is right. And then they'll, they'll spawn and her, her eggs are released at the beach and they're very, very important for migratory birds. So uh, as a food source for migratory birds, the eggs are. So if you see these guys on the beach, uh, leave them alone, don't harass them. Uh, occasionally you'll see some that you might think are dead. In some cases they may be dead horseshoe crabs, but they may also be molts where they shed their exoskeleton. And if that's the case, they'll be split open along this front edge here. My only caution to you there is that is a very, very smelly thing. <laughs> they, they, they smell really <laughs> bad. So before you pick one up, just be warned that even if it is dead, it's gonna smell really, really bad. So in general, when you see them, it's best just to take photos and, and leave them be. Thanks. If I can get this, gotta stay still. This is a pretty unique species that we encounter uh, fairly often on the EMTS survey. Um, this is a sea robin. As you can see, whoops, <laughs> I lost him. But uh, Eddie will show you. There you yeah, go. they have these, these uh, pectoral fins that fan out. They look like wings. And when they're swimming across the bottom, they look like birds swimming across the bottom. Some <laughs> of them have these modified uh, yeah. pelvic fins that look like little fingers. And some of these fish can actually crawl along the bottom using those modified fins. And they look like little fingers as they crawl along the bottom. They're really neat to see underwater uh, on scuba or, or, or snorkeling or something like that. 
kind of rare, but they're really neat to see. BJ's got one, and we don't see a whole lot of these here. They're, they're very common as bait fish in Florida and other places, but uh, this is a pinfish. Uh, we don't see them as much here. We tend to see more of them up in around uh, Wausau Sound, interestingly, up, up in that area. We see quite a few of them. Uh, but they're very, very popular as bait fish. There is actually a state record for a catch of one of these. I think it's about two pounds. It's kind of interesting. Uh, but they, that's, that's a, a average size for what we see. Called, uh, called pin fish basically because their spines are so sharp. They're like little pin cushions. And you try to pick them up, yeah. they can really stick you They down. will poke you. Um, another little critter that you've probably seen, maybe even in pet stores, this is a hermit crab. This is a pretty big one. Uh, inside a whelk shell, and uh, their shells, they don't grow a shell, they occupy a shell, so they, they move along until they grow to a point where they need a larger shell, and then they, they check to see if anything is in it, and if there's not anything in it, they'll come out of their old shell and move into their new shell and carry it off with them. If there is a hermit crab in that shell already, sometimes they'll fight and they'll fight over the shell and then whoever wins the fight gets the bigger shell. <laughs> uh, but you see these, uh, we see these a, a good bit. Um, in some cases, if you pick shells up on the beach, you may not immediately be able to see that there's actually a crab inside it. They can retreat really deep into the shell. So if you are picking up shells on the beach, especially these whelk shells or any of the, the, the things that were formerly occupied by a mollusk, a snail of some kind, uh, make sure you check inside and put it in some water for a little while and watch them. Make sure they don't move around. If they move around, that means there's something inside. So uh, either release it or just be aware that there's something you're gonna have to take care of there. All around in the tank here, you see these, these bundles, these little clumps here. These are oysters. These are Georgia oysters. Um, there are still folks who pick oysters commercially in Georgia. Uh, there's not as many as there were in the past. In, in, in the long ago history of Georgia, it was a huge, hugely important cash crop in Georgia. There were canneries where they shucked the oysters and canned them and shipped them all around the country. Uh, not as common now as they were at one time, but, but still both recreationally and commercially harvested in Georgia. Georgia's wild oysters tend to grow skinnier and taller uh, than the ones you would see in a restaurant, say an oyster on the half shell, sort of like a marketed oyster, but uh, they're, I'm told they're delicious. I don't eat them myself, but I'm told they're very good <laughs> from Georgia. But I do eat our shrimp and they are delicious. Uh, some of the best I've ever had. So um, I think that's about all we got, BJ. Anything else you wanted to? I, I think that's all I see. And that's about all we have to show you right now. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, feel free to give us a call. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Eddie and BJ, for that fascinating tour of underwater. And thank you for joining us for Coast Fest 2021. Uh, my name's Doug Haymans. I'm with Coastal Resources Division, and I get the honor of being your live rolling credits. So I'd like to say thank you to Joe Willie from 104.1 The Wave, uh, Leah king Designer from Gold, Keep Golden Isles Beautiful, and board member Nancy Addison for being our guest host this week. They did a great job. I think you'll agree. Thank you to all of CRD's team members who presented our videos and answered your questions this week. Uh, great job, guys. Great job. And specifically, thank you to the technical cast um, from, from Carl. Oh, I'm going to mess up if I try to name everybody. So let me just do this. Tyler Jones, thank you for putting together Coast Fest 2021. Uh, it, it's been a great time. Hopefully next year we'll be live and in person. We said the same thing last year, I know, but hopefully in 2022 we'll be live and in person. So again, thank you everyone for joining us. That's a wrap.